Carrie and I would like to welcome you to ISA's webinar series. Today we're going to take a first look at podcasting. And podcasting, as most of us know, is really exploding in the last few years. According to Edison's research, which was the Infinite Dial Study, 73 million people in the United States listened to podcasts monthly in 2018, and 48 million people are listening to them weekly. Just to put that into perspective, that's more than watch the NFL Sunday Night Football, which my husband and kids would be shocked about. Um, podcasting <laughs> offers entertainment and information to our mobile world. So whether we're cooking or commuting or even exercising, we can be entertained, we can be learning with this mode of communication. Podcasting is a mode of communication that training organizations can use to support both learning and learning transfer, as well as to create a learning community. Podcasting bolsters our thought leadership and reputation, and for some of us, it potentially could be a revenue generator, depending on how we bundle it. Um, so the question is for all of us in ISA, how do we get started if we haven't already dipped our toe into podcasting. It can seem really intimidating. And I'm on uh, one of the groups on webinars, and when podcasting came up, there was a sense of like, none of us have a lot of expertise in this. And that's why I wanted to bring in uh, my good friend and communication specialist, Carrie Hartman. Before I do that, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Amy Glass. I am both a senior facilitator, executive vice president, and soon to be owner of Brody Professional Development. We are a global uh, learning, leading, uh, learning company based on uh, leadership and communication skills. We have a team of trainers within the US and also global reach in South America and Europe, as well as Asia and Canada. Um, our focus is around leadership and communication, and we don't have a deep expertise in podcasting. So I'll be more facilitating this as a conversation with Terry, who is our expert. Terry is, as I mentioned, a communications professional. Her experience includes producing programs for Sirius XM. I know a lot of you listen to that. Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and CBS Radio. Most recently, Carrie served as supervising producer on the podcast Confronting O.J. Simpson, which um, maybe some of you have listened to. Um, it's really blown up in popularity. In fact, it's reached 5 million downloads since it launched um, in June 2019. And our plan today is to keep this conversational. This is not going to be a formal presentation, but instead a conversation where I'm asking Carrie her expertise around the communication skill of podcasting and getting started more than the technical aspect of it. Um, you're going to also have the chance throughout and at the end to ask her questions, as well as share your ideas and insights. We're going to keep it interactive using that text chat space since everyone is muted because we want it to be really sensitive to background noise. As we'll hear from Carrie, the audio experience is crucial to podcasting as well as um, for webinars like this one. Leo Brody, who kicked us off, is our technical producer, so he'll be there to help troubleshoot if we have any technical challenges. Please uh, join me in welcoming Carrie. Thank you so much, Carrie, for being here with us. Hi. I'm so excited. This is my first webinar, so I'm, I'm happy to be here. We're, Thanks for having me. We're your first. We're your first. We're excited about Yeah, you're my that. first. You're my first. Yeah, you're my first. <laughs> Never forget your ISA first. ISA is my first. I will never forget ISA, no. <laughs> yes. yes. We like being memorable in the ISA yes. community. <laughs> so um, as we were preparing for this, one of the things I said to Carrie is, in our business at Brody Pro, we're asked by clients a lot, do you have podcasts? Podcasts to um, support learning after the program. Podcasts to help their field teams continue to learning, learning when they're on the road and going to interact with customers. And I've always had to say no, because we haven't really gotten into this yet. And there's been an intimidation factor. So the question that I have, and I think a lot of ISAers have, is where do we start? Where do we start if we want to get into this world of podcasting? I think that's a great question. And I think the, one of the reasons it probably feels intimidating is it's not that easy. It's not, you know, going into your your living room and turning on an MP3 player and making a show. And 
you know, you think like, oh, everybody has a podcast. And it's true. A lot of people have podcasts. That doesn't mean that they're good podcasts. Right. It means that they made a show and uploaded it and put it on Facebook. But that doesn't mean it's a quality program. And in your business, you can't afford to put out anything less than something that's really crisp and tight and good. So when you're getting into it, you've got to be 100% in, and that's probably why it, it's hard to, to – you can't dip your toe in, to, you know, so to speak. You can't make a, a half of, like, a cheap podcast. Not, and I'm not implying that they're, they're so expensive you can't do it. But to answer your question, so what's the first thing that you do? The first thing that you do is you listen to a ton of podcasts. Not because you're going to replicate what they do, but to start to understand what makes a good podcast. You know, what do you find engaging? The same, the same way as you know, how do you, you know, how do you choose a book? How do you choose your television shows? What makes other forms of media attractive to you? So you start listening to podcasts, and it might be for your purposes a business podcast, although probably you know you probably would rather listen to, you know, history or true crime or some other topic. It doesn't matter, really, but you have to start to listen to, you know, how do they use music? How do they use sound effects? How do they get in and out of their breaks if they take them? And you take notes on those things, and I would spend a couple of months doing that before I even went down the path of creating something for myself. And when you and I were um, talking about today, we, mm -hmm. since we're both podcast listeners, I know you're a deep radio listener for many years, and in the last few years, podcast listener as well as producer, we came up with a list of a few suggested podcasts that we like, um, and we also want to hear some ideas from the ISA community and our, you know, our participants mm -hmm. today. Will you, can you show the slide of the uh, um, recommended, recommendations on podcasts that Carrie and I had? So what you're going to see up yeah. here in a moment is um, mm -hmm. someone that you may be familiar with. Um, a lot of people are uh, listening to Malcolm Gladwell's Revisionist History. Um, one of my favorites is episode Food Fight, uh, if you heard the difference between Vassar and Bowdoin. Um, Freakonomics Radio, and they were in Philadelphia, where Carrie and I both live, recording a live webcast last year. And I went with a few friends and got to see a podcast recorded, and they had interviewed a lot of guests from um, their University of Pennsylvania professors, UNC professors, Harvard professors, and seeing it recorded live was really interesting. Um, HBR IdeaCast, which we're going to hear from later, um, This American Life, which a lot of us are familiar with if you listen to NPR as well, um, Planet Money from NPR, and the OJ, Confronting OJ podcast, which is not just a shameless plug, it's really good. If you like cereal, you're going to like this. <laughs> it's um, a little but shameless. Really but so if you're sitting in your chair saying, okay, it's NPR, so I, we don't have the budget for an NPR mm. show. We don't have, you know, 50 people working on this. It doesn't really matter. It's um, a little audio background. Keep going, Kara. Sorry. Yeah, okay. That's not, it doesn't matter. It's still devices that people use to, to interview, to get into interviews. How do they open the show? It's it's those things that you want to be listening for when you're reviewing podcasts like this. I think Malcolm Gladwell is the master. He is the master at, at creating podcasts. If you're going to pick one of these things, that's the, that would be my go-to. He, he's the only person who creates podcasts where I look forward to the commercials. He makes commercials. <laughs> he, he, I've never heard somebody who takes a commercial and makes it as entertaining as the program. So kudos to Malcolm Gladwell for making commercials funny and fun. Figuring out the impossible. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> making pretty much, commercials fun again. Much. Yeah, he should be advertising. Yeah. So. Right, right. Sometimes if when you listen to podcasting, what we've discussed is that the commercials can be jarring. I don't think there'll be commercials for ISAers are kind of webinars, but that is no. something when you listen to kind of webinars that you'll start noticing that the, the commercials can be a little um, abrupt, uncomfortable, but I, in these examples, they figured out better how to do it. 
Um, I wanted to get a, a chance for uh, people participating on today's webinar to share some of your favorites so we can get a repository. Um, Leo, can you give instructions for those folks that are new to Adobe on how they can text chat some of their ideas, like if there are webinars, business ones, entertainment ones that they like a lot and they would recommend that they can type it in, so we'll have that here? Sure. Um, we have to be in this uh, with the chat window is just below the video mm -hmm. there, but um, you can type in the box. Rachel's going to, she's starting to type there. Just go and say, give a quick hi just to test it out. And um, maybe you can say where you're from. I love to hear <laughs> about quick. new ones. Please. I love hearing about it. So I'm just, you type in that little box uh, just above where it says everyone. Amy's, Amy's about to type. Yeah, I'm, I'm typing the question. I'm so That's curious to hear is. what people are, are, are um, listening to. All right, so Amy's asking, and Carrie are asking for your favorite podcast. Go ahead, jump in the chat and type away. I have to be honest, I'm a true crime junkie. Um, I, I'm, I really, if, it, if there's, um, if there's blood and guts in it, I'm probably going to listen to it. But, you know, Akimbo. Oh, interesting. Akimbo. Is, well, everything Seth Godin does is great. So that's a great one, Marjorie. Anybody else? Catherine, Olivia, Dustin. We have Rachel, Mary Beth, a bunch of folks on here. I'd love to hear your ideas. Okay, NPR's uh, Hidden Brain, Marketplace, mm -hmm. makes me start. Um, Kai and Molly, great. We have, this is small for me, I have to admit, the Adobe text chat, small, the dream, marketplace, the uncertain hour, and work life with Adam Grant. Excellent. This so is marketplace, a is a finan marketplace is a financial show. Um, I think that's what Rachel's talking about from um, American public media. So I'm, I'm assuming those are business-oriented podcasts, which are awesome. I'd love to hear those. That's great. Keep them coming. I'm not sure if anyone else is typing, but we'll, we'll give them a chance to keep going. But I'll keep asking you questions um, as we go. Um, mm -hmm. I had a chance to go to the C-level meeting in uh, Northern Virginia recently. And um, I was in my group of five. And I said, what is one question that you really want to know about podcasting? And they said, what we want to know is best practices. How do you make podcasts great? Um, so I know we're going to show some audio examples in a moment of that, and then you're going to give us, Carrie, some of um, the techniques that you really believe put, to put together a good podcasting show need to be there. Um, right before we do that, we've got one other comment, wow in the world, if you have kids. Um, so that's great to put on our radar. Our radar. Carrie also um, produced a, um, it's, I think you have three episodes out so far, Worse Mom Than You, which is a I would say more entertainment than educational show about mom fails that make you feel better about parenting. I just love it. So that's another one too. Um, Shameless okay, plug so, again. Okay. Yeah, but it's fun. It's really fun. I've told a bunch okay. of clients Thank about you. it. Thank you. All right. So let's um, let's listen to um, and Leo, have you put up the HBR, the Harvard Business Review Idea Cast? This particular episode is about meetings. And what we want you all to listen to is it's just the first minute and a half to two minutes of what makes it compelling to listen to. So, Leo, any directions for folks to, um, to listen to this, or you can just play it? Yeah, it should come over your, your computer speakers or however you're listening to the um, awesome. audio. And if it doesn't, um, uh, ra okay. You can raise your hand. Oh, let me show you how to raise your hand. Above uh, above the video panel, there's a, a man that looks like a man with his hand up in the air. If you click that, uh, that'll raise your hand. I'll watch, I'll watch for that. Welcome to, to the HBR IdeaCast from Harvard Harvard Business Review. Review. Okay. I'm Allison Beard. How many meetings will you attend today? This week? This year? How much of your time do you spend gathered around a conference table with colleagues, looking at plans or presentations or P&Ls? Our guest today estimates that in the U.S. alone, organizations play host to 55 million meetings per day. Ugh, 
Why do I say ugh? Don't we get important work done in meetings? Aren't they a good use of our time? Of it. Research says again. not really. Apparently, 30 to 40 percent of the hours we spend in meetings aren't productive. 73 percent of people admit to doing other work during meetings. 90 percent report daydreaming. And 64 to 65 percent of managers say meetings keep them from work and deep thinking. Should we just accept that a lot of meetings will be boring and wasteful? Or are there ways to avoid bad meetings, plan good ones, and get more out of the whole process? Stephen Rogelberg is a professor at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. He's the author of the book, The Surprising Science of Meetings, How You Can Lead Your Team to Peak Performance, and the HBR article, Why Your Meetings Stink and What to Do About It. Stephen, thanks so much for being on the show. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank you. Welcome to the so, HBR um, Ideacast from Harvard sure Business Review. Really I'm Allison Beard. Speakers. Harry, why is this a good example of how to start a podcast? The music was nice, um, which is super important. Like, it, it kind of drew me in. And she hit me from the beginning with something that I was interested in, which is meetings, because I have so many meetings with people I work with, and frankly, I hate them. I hate meetings. I just want to do my work. I don't want to meet with people to talk about my work. So I thought, okay, this is this could be useful information for me. Um, she did, she got right to it. She didn't waste a lot of time pontificating, and um, it's also coming from Harvard Business. So she let me know up front that she had, you know, it was it was research based. So that was interesting. And she got to the guest quickly. So there was a lot of things about it that worked for me. And she had a, she had a pleasant I voice, agree. honestly. She had a pleasant voice. She has a nice voice to listen to. She grabs our attention right away, which, Brody, one of the things we do is presentation skills training. I know some of the people on here also do presentation skills training as well. And we all teach to do a grabber. So to grab people's attention immediately, in this case with music, in this case with um, shocking statistics to draw us in, and, and relatable content. Like you said, who wants to go to all these meetings? And we're wasting a lot of time in meetings. And as you said, she brought in the guest pretty quickly, about a minute and a half in, so that you have two voices so it's auditorily engaging to listen to, not one talking mm -hmm. head. And he has a lot of expertise, as does she, so the source credibility is there. So um, it sounds like a lot of good factors. Let's contrast that with another um, podcast example. This is from a podcast called The Accidental Creative. We tried to pick examples that were business-related, and um, you're just going to listen to about a minute and a half of this one, too, and let's then discuss. All right, Amy and Carrie, I'm going to play it in a second, but I should have said this before. Please mute your phones while you're listening to the podcast because there's a delay. Thank you. Hey everyone, welcome to the Accidental Creative Podcast. My name is Todd Henry. I am your host. I'm also the author of several books, The Accidental Creative, Die Empty, Louder Than Words, and Herding Tigers, the new book about how to lead creative teams effectively. One thing that is necessary for the creative process to function properly is bravery. Now, when I say bravery, I think a lot of people think, you know, about charging up a hill, taking a hill, you know, defying the odds, being bold, in other words. But bravery isn't necessarily boldness. Bravery is something different. And bravery also, in the words of John Acuff, bravery isn't a trait, it's a choice. It's something we choose every single day. But what does everyday bravery look like to us as creative professionals? How does that manifest itself in our work. It's not just doing those big, bold projects that capture attention. Sometimes bravery can manifest itself in the small decisions we make, the little interactions that we have with others. Okay. Can you hear me now, Car? 
Yes, I can. Okay, hopefully everyone can. Good, good. Um, so let's contrast Access on Creative to the opening we heard from uh, HBR uh, IdeaCast. What didn't work here? That music. Like I, I just like it was. I felt like I, it was beatboxing, and then here are all the books I wrote. And here's the thing. You got a minute or two minutes, and you're done. You either get them or you're they're they're gone. Or I've moved on to another podcast. Now, when you're training someone, they're 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 a lot, They're done. They're stuck. You might be, <laughs> and you can, and you can read body language, right? So you know if something if something's not working or making an impact, you can probably um, try a different tactic or regroup and go in a different direction. If you're doing a podcast and and it's not working and you haven't grabbed somebody early on, they're gone and they're never coming back. There's no recovering from that. You don't have the benefit of, you're, you know, I've been hired for two hours, so we're gonna be together for two hours. You might not hire me again, but you've got that two hours. A podcast, there's no, there's no coming back from it. So when I heard this, it, it just was, it, it felt super self-indulgent and, um, it, and and also, I was like, wow, is he going to be talking the whole time? And so we listened to it for another, like, 20 minutes. Right. And, in fact, he was talking the entire time. So it was a monologue. And Right. So it from feel, the music, it feel well. so from the music at the beginning to um, how self-indulgent it felt, and then we kept listening to it at – you know, two minutes, he's still talking, he hasn't introduced a guest, you need, again, two voices at least, but we're like, okay, we'll listen for five minutes, no guest, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, he's still talking, it's a monologue, it's like he's talking to himself, and it's, it's not engaging at all. So let's look at other tips like that. You always say, look, mm -hmm. you're putting together a show, while it right. uh, can't be rehearsed or theatrical, it needs to be mm -hmm. compelling and entertaining, and it should deliver what you promise. Talk to us yes. about that and your other best practices for podcasts. So, you know, your show should be scripted. It doesn't mean that you read a script on a show, but you need to know what's your beginning and middle and end. You, 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 you create a narrative. You don't walk into a studio or go on a microphone and start reading, but you have a script so you can loosely follow and use it as an outline so you know if, it's, if you have a topic that you want to give to a client and say, look, if, if you need a refresher, here's a podcast that you can use at any time or download or, you know, play it in your car on the way to a meeting, on, on the way to a sales call. But it's got to feel conversational. Otherwise, it's, it's a book on tape or one of those 1970s, like, you know, um, self-help guru -y kind of things. It's got to feel it's got to feel natural and conversational. That doesn't mean that you leave things to chance. Um, we script everything and then we read it enough times that it feels natural when we say it. So you definitely you put the words on the paper and then when you go into the studio, you've got them to look at the paper if you need to look at the paper. Texture is a term that we use in audio, meaning there's more than one source besides your voice. So music is texture. Sound effects are texture. Let me give you another example. Um, let's say you wanted to talk about great business leaders. What I might suggest that you do is you, you go out on the street in a busy place and you walk up to 20 people with your iPhone, and you say, who's the greatest business leader in the country? And you might hear all kinds of different answers. Bill Gates, Rupert Murdoch, throw out some other ones, Dame, I don't know. Um, 
Okay. And you can be high <laughs> And you can be high up. cancer. Oh, we can yes, keep going. Okay. Getting there. Okay. Okay. So you compile all of these, and then you open your show by saying, people have lots of different ideas about what makes a good business leader or who a good business leader looks like. And then you bring in these different voices. You hear the street noise. You hear the accents. You add color. That's what texture in audio is. It's t getting rid of what we just heard, which is that voice, that just one voice. And it makes it a little bit more interesting. You don't have the video, the images that we have in television. If you watch TV, let's say you watch news or an informational program, watch and count how long a camera is on one image. Maybe it's on 10 seconds at the most before the image right. changes to something else. This is why in podcasting, in audio, we try really hard to bring in texture. So you got, you're, cre you're a creative group of people um, to begin with. You find creative ways to motivate people. You bring that into podcasting by creating texture and creating audio. And again, not expensive, not difficult to take your iPhone. And I've cheated this so many times by doing it in the office, wherever office I'm working in, and going around the office and getting that audio, but just bringing it in so it's a little bit more interesting. There is an expression, um, because I produced morning shows before I had kids and I could no longer get up at three o'clock in the morning to go to work. When I worked in radio, the expression was funny wins, funny wins. Now, there's lots of times when funny is not appropriate when you're doing a podcast about plane crashes. Obviously, like there's no room for humor. Um, that's, I'm referencing that to the last podcast I listened to was about the Southwest um, incident in Philadelphia where the pilot landed the plane even though the window blew out. And um, it was, it's a very interesting story. Um, but humor is a big emotional mover of people. If they're laughing, they're with you. So if you have a way to open a podcast, you know, by telling a story that's got humor, it's a very successful thing with audio to tell a great story and engage people that way. We were talking about commercials before and, and why Malcolm Gladwell does so well with his podcast. And one of the reasons is he's funny. And the commercials are funny that he does. He does the commercials for, so I think it's hotels.com or one of those. And he talks about, I can't remember the book, it's not Madeline, but it's one of the little girls who stays in the Plaza Hotel as a kid. And, uh, oh, no, I know which one. What's the movie with the woman who encounters Norman Bates? Um, oh, gosh. Psycho, Psycho. It's, it's a oh, Hotels.com commercial. But he, you don't know it's a Hotels.com commercial because he starts out talking about seeing Norman Bates on TV the other night. And why did she end up getting murdered and strangled? because she had no options, because Hotels.com wasn't in business back then. So that's why she ended up at Norman Bates Hotel. It's a crazy story, but I was hanging on every word because it was hilarious. So, you know, maybe your podcast has a fake commercial. That's something about your business that you just create in your office. The sky is the limit, but here's the thing. The audio has to have quality. You can't just throw up some soundproofing in your office and say, we're going to make a podcast. If you are going to do this, you have to find a studio in your city. You have to hire an engineer, and you have to edit it and do it the right way. If after a certain amount of time, you find that this is something your company wants to continue doing, then it makes sense to talk about creating something in-house where you can continue doing on a regular basis. 
But if you're going to try it and see how it works for you, you can't cheat the quality because it will cheapen your brand if it doesn't sound right. And it's not prohibitively expensive to go to a studio and do it. It's a couple hundred dollars, maybe 100 or 200 an hour. You have an engineer and you get it done. But you cannot budget. You can't half do it. You've got to... You've got to have professional people work with you. Um, and I'm not saying this because I'm a producer. I'm saying this because I've heard it done both ways. And it's better to not do it than to do it badly. Yeah. Absolutely. And I know we're going to explore more about audio options, whether um, mm -hmm. studio time and give them a name for looking at mm -hmm. that nationally, because people here are based all over the United States, as yeah. well as uh, if yeah, you wanted please, to invest yeah. in a very quiet space within your office, where would you get that equipment? I know that you have a few other tips, though, around best practices. Mm -hmm. One of them you had said to me, um, and I'm just reading my notes because I thought it was really interesting, was about creating a partnership between your podcast and your digital media. Right. And you had some examples yeah. of that. I think the ISAers may be really interested mm -hmm. in this. So they can support each other. If you're going to do a podcast, then you would want to drive traffic back to your website. I'm just going to throw out, again, I'm using, like, leadership just because I don't know so much about your business, but I'm just what I've learned from Amy. But if you're talking about something having to do with leadership, you might be having a dialogue and say, you know, we've posted the five leadership fails you never want to encounter on our website. If you want to go check that out, it's on the home page. We're going to have it up for the next week or two or month or whatever go to brodypro.com. It's there. I think you're going to find it really helpful. It's, these are things that you don't, you, you never want to encounter, and we've got the list. Really bite-sized, simple things that you can put on your podcast and then push people to your website. I mean, obviously, you're going to, to put on your website that you have a podcast and where that can be found and what platforms it could be found. But you can also really embed things in the podcast to direct more information, information you don't want to read because you never want to read things on your podcast. You only want it to be conversational. And so that's a great way to push people back to your website. I love that. I love the, that they're mutually supporting each other. So you're driving people to the website through the podcast and then to get, um, hey, know that we have a podcast and here are ones we're dropping on customer service or project management or influencing without authority and it's driving them to the podcast so there's this mutuality yeah. about it that's great i mean we did that even with crime right so when we did the oj simpson podcast um we had a lot of of images of the podcast was done with one of the victim's siblings and we had a ton of photos I mean, we're, this is audio, but on the podcast, you know, we, we'd say, you know, if you want to see some photos of, of the host with Ron Goldman, who was one of the victims, you know, here's the website, go and check it out. And we had tons of photos and artifacts um, from his life that were there. So we were constantly driving people to the website from the podcast there. I hear that a lot on radio listening to NPR. They'll say to hear the rest of this interview or to find out more about X or to see these maps or these documents, and they drive you to the visual uh, medium, which in this case is the mm -hmm. website. That's really smart. Um, something you've always told me is important. I've seen this on webinars as well, like anything audio-driven, is you need more than one voice. You need guests. Talk to us about um, having guests as a best practice and, and why that's important. I think that unless you are the most dynamic person in the world, um, it's great. It's, Which it's we are as I am there. I know you are. I know. As, as people in the world, you are the most dynamic. Um, but it's hard to listen to a monologue. Even, you know, when you listen to talk radio, if you ever listen to talk radio, talk show callers are props. That's why they take callers on talk radio. Because, I mean, the professional talent 
they're professional talent. They take callers to use them as props so they can have a dialogue because nobody would listen to somebody just talk on and on and on. So that's why sometimes you listen to these people and go, oh my gosh, that guy from South Philly, he's such an idiot. I can't believe he's talking to him. Well, he's talking to him because he needs a vehicle for conversation. And you, I mean, you're not gonna book Tony from wherever um, and argue with him about red light cameras but a dialogue is much more interesting to listen to than a monologue. It's not a show. It's, it's not a show. And by the same uh, thought, you don't want to overload it with voices because nobody can keep track of who's speaking. Another thing I want to mention is the length of a podcast and at best mm. practices is, a, is, is the length of a commute. How long does it take people to drive to work? 20 minutes, 30 minutes? That's really your sweet spot is how long people drive to work in the car because that's a big part of when people are listening to podcasts is when they're driving to work. If you check out business podcasts and even crime and, and other podcasts, they're, they fall into that 25 to 45 minute spot. You don't see a lot of podcasts that are an hour, an hour and a half. They're too long, and you, you, you don't have that much to say. You should, it means that the editing isn't being done properly. You really have to get it down and edit it to the point where it is absolutely, you know, the most salient informa and interesting information. I think that's great advice for us, that it, uh, a podcast is really the time of a commute. Um, and I think from some of the business ones we look at, it's the tighter end of that, more like the 25 versus the 40, um, although there's some exceptions. There's a trend in training and learning, which is called micro-learning, which is about, A, learning on demand, learning what you need when you need it, mm -hmm. but also learning in small bites because, you know, when Marjorie started Brody in the 1980s, she taught like a three to five day presentation skills class. And now people are like, we're lucky to get two days, much more commonly have one day or sometimes a half day. Or what I did with two weeks ago, can you give us 90 minutes on great presentations? And what they're getting towards is like, okay, we know this is important, but we have no time. So how would podcasting um, align with this idea of micro learning? So I don't see a lot of that in podcasting because it's not really – podcasting is kind of meant to be a long-form format. I think it could be an interesting thing to do, but only if you drop it a bunch at one time. So almost like the way Netflix gives you a whole series at once. So, you know, if you dropped 10 – of those micro programs at one time, I think that would that would be an interesting device. I, I would be curious about that. I think to drop one three minute program would be odd. So you could say we have a new podcast series. We've got 10 micro podcast programs because people could listen to several at one time but I would not drop them as individual programs. That would be my Kind of like response. Netflix or they can binge yeah. them as Like, yeah, as the as crown. Or the crown, yeah. Yeah. You know so we're excited it's, about it's the always, crown. Yeah. yeah, we are. But, I mean, because then it, so it feels substantial. Absolutely. I like that idea. So back to uh, the idea of presentation skills, you could have a mini podcast, micro-learning about – how to open a presentation with impact, or how to mm -hmm. start a dialogue with an audience, or um, five techniques to combat st stage fright. So you could do it in those little bites, but as you say, drop them as, as a group together, because it's a lot easier, and then people can yeah. cherry pick what they're most interested in. Yep. Yeah, as long as they're dropped that's as great. a series, I think that's fine, but not like, not like next week, another Next week, we'll bring you another micro program that's four minutes long. Right. I think that, that would be strange. Yeah. 
Right. I don't think we're that interesting. It's not like a murder mystery where everyone's waiting for the planet. That they would do that. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we've already touched on this idea of how to open up a podcast, but just maybe explore that a little more. And I know I want to hear an example from the OJ one of how you do that with music and words that, like, as you said, within the first minute or two, people oh. are making a decision. And I would align that to webinars and face-to-face -face training, too. Even I'm if they're gonna, stuck in that room, yeah. they're deciding whether they're interested. This, I, I, I will tell you from this, just this was, the hardest thing that we did in this podcast, because now we have two generations. We have people who were alive. I don't know how many people on this webinar remember the murder and the trial. I would love to know, actually, if you guys. There's a lot of me. boomers and experts on this, so um, okay. I think a lot so, of us remember. Okay, so so there was all kinds of team discussions. Do we start with the murders? Do we start with the trial? Do we start with the Bronco? Leo remembers, right? Okay, do we start with the Bronco chase? And if you're my age, you watch the Bronco chase in real time. You watch the murder trial. It, the country was transfixed when this happened. I'm trying to give you some a, a modern equivalent of this. I'm trying to think of something that is culturally um, equivalent to the Simpson murders in the 90s, and I can't even think of one, to be honest with you. So we spent so much time, because if you're 25 years old, I, we told people, we did this. We went to a park, and we asked 20 people, what do you know about the O.J. Simpson murder? And kids under under 25 were like, oh, wasn't he a football player? Did he kill somebody? They didn't know anything. So we had to recalibrate and approach this as if listeners knew nothing. And that's how we decided to open, that is how we decided to open the show. But it took a ton of pushing and pulling and arguing and and that's probably too much information. But just to show you how much well, just the contact, that. we're really thinking about the audience, like this audience. So let's listen to it. Let's have Leo um, sure. just listening of it, of what you guys had to do to engage that audience. OJ Simpson who many people was who born in San Francisco on more July 9, 1947. Um, may not My know brother, it, Ronald Lyle Goldman, Goldman bring was born in a Chicago moment. suburb on July 2nd, 1968. OJ's parents separated when he was five. He was raised by his mother. Our parents divorced when Ron was six. We were raised by our father, Fred. As a teenager, O.J. got into trouble, but turned his life around through football. As a teenager, Ron spent summers as a camp counselor and played Little League baseball. O.J. was recruited by USC, won the Heisman Trophy, and was the number one NFL draft pick in 1969. He went on to have a Hall of Fame career. Ron attended college for a semester in Illinois before we all moved to Los Angeles. After retirement, O.J. worked as a sports commentator, an actor, and a spokesperson. Ron worked as a recruiter, a tennis coach, and a waiter. Ron planned to open his own restaurant and bar. On June 12, 1994, O.J. attended his daughter's dance recital with his ex-wife, Nicole, and her family. They went to dinner at Metzalona Restaurant to celebrate. O.J wasn't invited. On June 12, 1994, Ron was working as a waiter at Mezzaluna Restaurant. His shift ended, and he headed to Nicole's house to return a pair of sunglasses. That night, the two men crossed paths at the home of Nicole Brown Simpson. What happened next altered families, changed lives, and reset American culture. Forever. Okay. Dramatic. Probably we're unmuted. That is so powerful. So dramatic. 
um, how you brought us into that moment and remembering 25 years ago where this is all anyone was talking about. And we had to show like how these two people whose lives like were had nothing to do with each other converged and start the right. story it's from that moment. their convergence. Yeah. Um, but it was complicated because we it was we had to start from the fact that nobody knew anything and that's that's you know sometimes you've got to think about who's who's your audience are they right. people who are completely new to your leadership your guidance are they people you've worked with before are they people who aren't your clients yet Absolutely, you've got to target it to your audience. That, that's absolutely essential. The other thing I really like is the music there. And you've said to me that music is another guest on a podcast. Um, right. Can you just give us some ideas of one or two sites we could go to to get music? Because you've said mm -hmm. it's not expensive. There's a lot of great options out there, but people in our business may not know about it. So. That music, I have to say, um, we we that we had that music custom. We had that music written for the show, but right. I've used music from sites. So music is inexpensive. Um, the last couple times I needed music, I'd go on a website and I can license it royalty free for about fifty bucks, and it's. It's great. I mean, it's so wonderful um, to be able to do that. Uh, the, the site that I've used most frequently, I'm looking for the name of it. I think it's called Soundstripe. Um, um, Aim, I don't know if I have it handy, the name That's of okay. the we can um, send it music to site. Yeah. Um, if no. I can find it, I'll send it over. Um, oh, it's called, I'm sorry, here it is. It's called Shutterstock, Shutterstock. But there's a million, oh. if you, if you, Shutterstock, if you look and say um, royalty-free music for podcasting, so many show up. I like Shutterstock. It's easy to use, and they break the music down into parts. So if you like a piece that's, you know, just the bass or that's the more rocking piece of it. They break it down into parts so you can take sections of it. So it's really, really easy to use. Um, so I, I, I like using that. And I love, pick, I love that part of it, you know, picking the music and, and working with it and making that part of the show. I do feel like the music is a guest in the sense that it's, it's speaking to you. It's, it's telling you what the show is, what kind of show is this going to be, you know, right. um, an tone. informational show, what, you know, it gives you, right, it's, it's setting, it's setting the tone for you. So the music's a big deal, but you can, you're starting to see now, there's a script, there's music, there's sound, there's, yeah. sound. you know, right, there's a lot of elements. Do you have to do it that way? No. But that's what separates a great production from two people just sitting in a room and talking. That's, that's well, what we may have some more questions from the, yep. from the group, too, and I want to get to them. So Sorry right about before my, like, touched through. by an angel light here. Yeah. The light. It's yeah. very flattering. Yeah. I like it. Yeah, thank you. Um, but I'm thank just going to ask you real briefly some questions that mm -hmm. ISAers had asked me to ask you, and then we'll get to sure. the folks that are also on here. One uh, just quick question is, how often should we drop, release, whatever you want to say, a new podcast? Like, are we doing these weekly, monthly, annually? I think that if, if you're serious and something you really want to do, do a pilot. Do a pilot. You know, do one and see, like, how much time does it take? You know. Who is the right person in your company to host it? Or do you need an outside person to be the host, to, to be the facilitator? Do you want to hire somebody who's like the host, who is the facilitator, and then you're the guest? I doubt that's the case, just based on the kind of work that you do. Um, and see what it takes to put it together. So we're going to give you guys a list of, just to get you started, like, a website that tells you where in your 
in most of the country where there's studios with engineers that can help you. Um, and try, like, do it and see what it is and what it takes to do, to do one and if it's something that you really want to put time into. And then I would say, you know, you'd want to put one out if you decide, yes, this is something our company wants to be involved in, you know, five, six times a year for it to be a thing that your company does. You can't put you can't put a podcast out twice a year and say you're podcasting. You know, you you'd want to put it out um, at least monthly to every other month. Doing it weekly or biweekly, you're hiring a team to do that. It's that that's you you you've got to that's something that a communications team. You've got to be a big enough company that you're designating a communications people on a communications team to be doing that for. A good deal of time and then if that becomes if you're if you're there for a while and you, it's really become something that's a part of your company um, then you can think about bringing it in-house and building out a room it's, it's not a big deal but you know you might spend two grand on equipment and then you might soundproof the room Let's show these slides where you're giving this advice. Leo, if you could first sure. start with the podcast rental slide, just so everyone has a visual of it's just one option. But if you are interested in looking into uh, studio time, um, one of the sites um, that Carrie shared with us, and you're going to see it open up here, is podcast rental, so online marketplace for podcasters to rent mm -hmm. or share a podcast studio in minutes. So that's something, if people want to go to that studio, let's put up the other one if they were right, what you were saying now is think of investing in that, um, in their own yeah, office, so I, they yeah. have a quiet space. I like Broadcast Supply Worldwide because they know their equipment. So when I needed a new microphone or something, you know, you're not going to get, Amazon might have the piece, but they don't know what they're they don't know what they're selling you. So I use BSW because they can talk to me about what they're selling and walk me through it. And that's, I'm not that tech savvy. So I need that kind of support. Absolutely. I think most of us yeah. would as well. And I know we need to get to um, the ISA survey. So Angela's going to wrap us up in a second. But there was one other thing. Um, it's the next slide. Mm -hmm. Leo, on Descript, and if you could just briefly, Carrie, tell us why Descript is great, especially if you're going to do some of those interviews mm -hmm. um, that you talked about with a CEO or with a man mm -hmm. on the street. Um, what is Descript? So Descript is a game-changing um, application that more people are not using because I, I think they just don't know about it. Descript takes audio, so let's say you tape an interview with somebody ahead of time, which is fine to, to introduce into a podcast. You can take you can interview somebody on an MP3 player, a portable MP3 player, and it makes a transcript electronically in about a minute. And you can edit the transcript, and the transcript edits your audio. So. Before the script, you would take a transcript and you would go on, if you look below, on an audio um, app, and you would have to do them separately. You would hold the transcript and then you would edit the audio. This is the first time forever. that it takes, it's a, it's a labor-intensive thing. Anybody, you don't have to be an audio professional can go on the script with their interview, get it, get it um, transcribed. Translate, yeah, transcribed into a Word document and edit it, and it automatically edits your audio. It's the, it has changed my life. <laughs> it's changed my life. He's a huge to have fan this. of it. I am love this. I love this technology. It is life changing for me in the time it saved. So, and when you get, if you, yeah. too. 
relatively inexpensive. Yeah, I love it. That's great. Well, I'm so appreciative of you, you being here and answering all these questions. I feel like we could do this for hours. I'm going to bring this to Angela, though, who may uh, tell us about some things coming ahead for ISA mm -hmm. and also ask mm -hmm. about the survey to get feedback. From my understanding, this is the first webinar about podcasting, and it carries your first webinar. And I so appreciate you sharing mm -hmm. these insights with us. Sure. Um, Angela, can you uh, share with us what's coming ahead for ISA? Yeah, definitely. First and foremost, thank you so much, Carrie and Amy, and everyone who sure. has joined. Coming up, we have the ISA Financial Benchmark Study, which is going to launch membership on December 16th. And then our next webinar is going to be what it takes to be a thoughtful leader with a successful book, and that's on January 24th. And then hopefully we will be seeing all of you at the annual business retreat in Scottsdale. So feedback is a gift, and we really appreciate knowing what you liked about this webinar and what you think could be better. So we're going to push out the survey, but I just want to thank Carrie and Amy again for being here and Leo for running this. I really appreciate it. Thank you all. And uh, let us know if you need any of the copy of these slides for these.